We'll just we'll use the time, even if we can't be formally in session. Um, oh, look at that! And suddenly we have a quorum. So perfect timing, Council Lee. Um, we we will. Um, I think we'll skip the reports and go straight to recognition of guests. Um, I, I had mentioned in here before, and, and I know Council and Clerk's Office both knew. We're excited to have Vanderbilt University with us today. Um, I had gotten a an opportunity to see a presentation of their MoveBU program, which besides Vanderbilt winning a pretty substantial grant to make this possible, um, it's it's a great uh, exposure to the idea of transportation demand management and what a campus as complex uh, as Vanderbilt's and what facilities and operations as complex as Vanderbilt's as a major Middle Tennessee employer can do. So I'm, I'm excited to have uh, both Karen Hafkenshield and Mike Perez Correct. At, uh, with us today to present this. So with that, we'll, play, we'll take a few minutes to allow uh, the two of them to present new to you. So thank you both for being here. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that. And just uh, we have 15 minutes for our presentation there, Bob. Right? Although 10 minutes would probably be satisfying. To <laughs> That's all I need to know. That's all I need to know. Uh, well, good, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Perez, and I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor for uh, Facilities at Vanderbilt University. Excited to be here. And uh, as mentioned, uh, this is an exciting effort initiative for the university, MoveEU, and MoveEU is a subset initiative under what we call Future VU. And so I'm going to just give you some very quick context as to what future VU is and how movie VU fit, fits into this. So future VU is effectively the university's campus master plan. Other universities will acknowledge it as that, and uh, we do as well, our land use plan. But we like the name future <coughs> VU, obviously, because it uh, signifies how we are looking towards the future and then how we develop the campus uh, for all the right reasons. And, and just very quickly here, uh, this is based on a vision where uh, we do uh, see our campus as a sacred ground. And uh, it is our home base, and we cherish it. We think a lot of it. And resulting from that, we want to be responsible stewards so that we develop some ways that, uh, that are consistent with our values. And as we consider our campus, we are part of the Nashville fabric, and we're excited about that. And you can see on the left where is our, our campus outline, and then uh, over to the right, you see where, where we sit uh, with respect to the city. And then we acknowledge where our, our crane watch, uh, the activity that is occurring in the city. And so uh, the message being is that we're part of a very vibrant uh, an exciting municipality, and we're, we're really grateful for that. Some of those cranes are Vanderbilt. Uh, correct, correct. That's exactly right. We contribute yeah, all sorts of ways. Uh, and, and so with that understood, then, uh, and as we drill down into what we're doing at the university with respect to our campus master plan, and then this, 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 this word collage, if you will, talks about a number of those elements that we really value with the diversity and collaboration and community discovery and the like. And so these are a result of town halls that we had where we developed this uh, future VU over a two-year process. And uh, these are parts of what then guide uh, our guiding principles or uh, input into our guiding principles. And I'm not going to read all these here in the interest of time, but I will focus on the fact that uh, we do acknowledge our diverse and inclusive uh, uh, mission. We are a community in neighbors, neighborhoods, and we are a important, we think, and desired to be inclusive neighbor uh, to Nashville and the community that we reside in. And that's really, really important. And as such, and you can see at the uh, second from the bottom, we want to be a walkable and sustainable campus. Again, part, parts of our value. So here you see a series of neighborhoods and uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to go th through uh, very quickly here. These just illustrate what those are. Many of you probably are familiar with those. Uh, and then this now starts to, to, to yield the framework for the campus uh, and our master plan. And I'll just point very quickly that uh, what is occurring here is that we're developing, if you will, uh, spines or pedestrian networks that will better connect and unify our disparate neighborhoods. Uh, 
Uh, and then as we do that, we are very mindful that then we look at our edges on the campus and then how we can likewise uh, connect to, uh, to our community. Uh, I like to talk about our edges as a membrane, you know, not, not unlike your skin, where it isn't intending to be insular, where we want to keep people out. Uh, quite the opposite, we want to be able to go in and out. And so uh, what we are planning, and which Aaron will talk about uh, later, is how our edges work with the community, how we intersect bike lanes, how we intersect other, other thoroughfares. And then as you come on the campus, then we will have a network of pedestrian zones that we are transitioning to that will again develop a, uh, a campus community that's consistent with our values. So the, uh, the master plan, Future View, uh, is developed with these major components and what we call cross-cutting themes. And the major components are that of our residential living. So we do have undergraduate and, and graduate and professional housing. Uh, likewise, and, and critically important, our academic and research operations. Uh, and then our real estate uh, holdings and the perimeter and off-campus properties and like. And all those three, three are the primary buckets or components, as you'll, you'll note. And then there are these cross-cutting uh, features that apply uh, throughout the entire campus, which are the utilities, the infrastructure, sustainability, environment, mobility, transportation, public safe, uh, parking and safety, and diversity and inclusion. So these cross-cutting themes, uh, quite honestly, apply to all of the components. And so it's that framework uh, where this master plan was, was built. So, I'm going to show a real quick video here that will, you know, they say a picture is better than a thousand words or a hundred thousand words sometimes, but uh, this video, quick video, will give you uh, an idea of what I'm describing when I talk about how we take, what's that linking? Is it not connected to the might not be. What is it? Let's see. Five minutes that we're going to try to try that and see where that goes. Yeah, it seems like it is. It might need a prompt of a Google that says. So we have to skip it. Okay. Okay, we can skip it. Uh, so you missed a real nice before and after <laughs> really a fly through. It was really, really cool because what it talks about, and you can see in the bottom uh, left, this is an example of uh, what we refer to as our West End neighborhood. Uh, many of you who know are, are familiar with our campus uh, know that's where many of the uh, Green Life resides and other uh, student uh, organizations. And when you're in that neighborhood, uh, there's lots of parking. There's lots of alleys with parking. Uh, there's lots of utility uh, poles with aerial lines going down that, that, that stretch or those stretches. And what we will be doing with what we're constructing along the West, the West uh, Avenue, uh, West End Avenue, is we're constructing our new residential colleges. And as we do that, we are removing parking from that entire district, uh, hundreds of surface parks. And we are transforming those parks into pedestrian zones. We will have. Uh, the, uh, the pedestrian zones uh, constructed in ways to where emergency vehicles and service vehicles are going to be able to, to, to drive on them, but it'll be primarily pedestrian. Again, we were wanting to uh, create this sense of place on campus where, uh, where it is consistent with our value stream. Uh, along with that project, uh, on other major projects on campus, like on 21st Avenue, where the nursing uh, project uh, just completed and, and the divinity uh, project was completed, we've again removed more parking. So all of this uh, intentional uh, so that uh, we can create, a, 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 as I keep on referring to, uh, a really nice campus that uh, does lend more to a pedestrian experience. So when you talk about parking and we're removing, I'm talking about removing parking, You'll see, as illustrated here, we have plenty of parking. We have short of 22,000 parking spots on our campus. Which How many does the city of Nashville own? Uh, it was actually hard to get a full inventory. Um, if you, The biggest deck structures are here, the library, Fulton campus, 
And then I think we identified several thousand more on street meter parkings. I can't remember offhand. It's it's several thousand presentations. But less you might, than us. Yeah, less than fewer the fewer spaces. My memory is that it's forty five hundred. Yeah. Forty five hundred? Wow. It's, yeah, it's fewer than ten thousand by my last count. Well, this, this represents uh, our inventory of parks, which is for Vanderbilt University and for the medical center. We do have a major, uh, you know, rush of uh, early morning and uh, late afternoon uh, activity, as you can imagine, by the, the vehicular impact. But all of that, uh, you know, consumes 82 acres of, you know, our 340-acre campus thereabouts. 25% of our ground, and if you uh, uh, assume a 200 to $300 a square foot for that ground, you know, all this parking is consuming, you know, between either 700 to $1.1 billion of real estate. Is that, you know, is that the right use for this valuable real estate? Uh, so we think that we can repurpose for, for better use. And so as we consider that, then uh, given where we uh, are in, in time with respect to all the technologies that are coming about around transportation, and we're aware of all of those as you can see up here, uh, we think that we can help by leading efforts to challenge ourselves and to consider innovation and to develop infrastructure that will support alternative modes of transportation. Some of them could be uh, as illustrated up here, and others of which uh, have yet to be determined. And as we talk about and consider our campus environment and uh, that of uh, our faculty, staff, and in particular, and where they live in relation to, uh, to campus, uh, this is just a, a chart that illustrates uh, those who are fortunate enough to have relatively nice salaries tend to live closer to campus. Uh, those who uh, don't have as great a salary live further away from campus. Uh, and so you can see how this illustrates uh, that very, very specifically, uh, which is really alarming in some regards. But uh, there's a lot of our, our staff who would benefit by having alternate modes of transportation to get into to, to, to campus. So and this is just a, a, uh, a visualization of where by, we know where all our people live by zip codes, and so these dots represent all of those uh, that live in, in this, this general area. And the, the red dots are the higher salaries, and the, and the blue and, and greener dots are those with the lesser salaries. As you can see how we are distributed further away of those with the lower salaries, and yet those are the ones who would benefit by having you know, some alter, uh, alternative forms of transportation. We don't have the solution, but we have a lot of data, and with that data, then Movie you developed. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Aaron. I mean, you could probably be pretty quick. So. I, can, I can talk really fast. All right, let's do it. Um, so I wanted Mike to really give the background of Future BU because this is something that is a really big, important priority for Chancellor Zeppos and for Vice, Vice Chancellor Kopstein. And so it's something that we're have a lot of resources and commitment to move forward with. And so I'm going to talk about the goal that we've set, some of the changes to the built environment, which, which Mike already talked about, and then some of our programs and policies to help us achieve this goal. So the first thing we did was we did a mode share survey to identify how many people are coming to campus that are driving alone. Um, Davidson County, just for reference, is about an, has an 85% drive alone rate, and so Vanderbilt's doing better at just under 70%, but we think we have um, a lot more room to grow. This is a, another version of the map that Mike just showed, but we overlaid a couple different lenses. We looked at everyone that lives within a mile of campus and so could walk, everyone that's within a three mile bike potential you know, loop that could bike, and then everyone that is close to a one seat transit ride to campus, both MTA routes, a quarter mile from an MTA route, and five miles from an RTA park and ride. And we were pretty blown away by these numbers. 26%, even with the income and distance um, correlations that we're seeing, 26% of our faculty, staff, and graduate students, which is about 12,000 people, still live within a mile of campus. Um, almost 40% live within three miles, and then 35% are um, close to a one-seat transit ride to campus. <laughs> 
So based on these numbers, we've set a 2025 MUVU VU goal of taking that drive alone rate from about 70% to 47%. And this is being driven both by what mode shares we think we can achieve from a walking, biking, and transit perspective based on those capture potentials, but also the number of parking spaces that we're going to lose because of the capital infrastructure projects that Mike and his team are working on, new residential colleges um, and new academic buildings. So as, as, as we're lo uh, looking to create um, MoveVU, some of the physical infrastructure that we're talking about is creating a walker's paradise, a walker, biking, scooter paradise um, that is also easily accessible by public transit. This is our infrastructure map that we're talking about, and all um, the blue line that goes all the way around is a new 5K walk and roll loop. And then um, Mike talked a little bit about the primary greenway that will run from the historic core down 25th Avenue. And during our OFO bike share pilot, we, we actually learned that there's a ton of traffic that's coming from the West End neighborhood over to the Peabody campus. So we've added an additional primary greenway as well. This is a rendering of what the campus loop will look like. This is 21st Avenue and Terrace, so right in front of the Baker Building. And you're probably familiar with what it looks like currently up there on the right. There's an iron fence, the magnolia trees, and then two, la two lanes of parking. So if we can remove that parking, remove the fence, plant some additional trees, we will have room for a 14-foot multi-use path. Um, and we can do this almost entirely around the, fi the 5K loop around campus. The greenway that we're imagining, we're imagining to be a little bit wider. Also a multi-use path, so we're not thinking about like a bike lane over here or a walking lane over here, um, and a 20-foot path. That will, in some places, have to wind around some of our existing historic trees, but for the most part, this is what we're gonna, what we're gonna try and achieve. And the last thing I'll talk about is, you know, of course, we're building the team to talk about this, thinking about the communications, but we're really thinking about incentives and disincentives to drive behavior. And then since we're a university, of course, talking about how to analyze this data um, and behavior change over time and adjust, adjust as that's happening. So the big thing that we're thinking about from an incentives and disincentives is right now everybody in the Vanderbilt community pays for an annual parking permit. So you buy your permit in August and you're locked in for the rest of the year. And so if you can walk a couple days a week, there's not an incentive to do that because you've already sunk your costs into your parking permit. So we're looking at um, transitioning to a daily parking model and we're going to do this over three years, starting with four parking structures, hopefully um, this fall. And then um, Councilman O'Connell mentioned the grant that we got from the CMAC program. More than half of that grant is um, including incentives for alternative travel. So we will actually be able to pay a financial reward to um, members of the Vanderbilt community for choosing an alternative mode. The other thing that's really exciting about launching a TDM program right now, which hopefully both the city of Nashville and Vanderbilt will be able to take advantage, is these new mobility apps. So we'll have an app um, on whoever wants to can opt into having it on their phone. And if you tap into one of our garages with your Vanderbilt ID card, it'll automatically log that that's how you got to campus that day. It'll charge you for parking. Or alternatively, if you took the bus, you use your Vanderbilt ID card to swipe on the MTA bus, automatically logs in that you rode the bus that day, and you'll also get your financial reward. So this is gonna be a huge way to, to better track sort of how the university is coming to and from campus, both how we're charging and providing rewards, um, and will just sort of be a wealth of information for the Vanderbilt community to know what options they have available to us, but also a wealth of information for us to be analyzing as we're developing the program. Um, we've had lots of our professors that have been interested in working on this with us. Uh, two of our engineering professors helped us apply for the CMAC grant. Um, so one of the really cool things that we're doing in partnership with Public Works is, as you guys know, Public Works is getting ready to install some of the new blue toad um, sensors as um, to help with the 440 closures. We're also installing four, five, four, five? Yeah. five array of things sensors at four of our biggest entrances, entrances to campus, and they will have um, real-time traffic counts, real-time bike and bike ped counts. They'll be the only stationary bike ped count counters in the city, um, and so we're excited to start tracking some of this data and sharing it more broadly. Good. We'll probably uh, pause on this. I would ask uh, if folks have comments and questions, feel free to submit them directly to me or, uh, you know, Mr. Jamison as appropriate. 
in the council office, and I'll make sure they get distributed to the DU team. Um, we can certainly have them back or do this more in depth. Some of you might know that <coughs> planning is leading a metro-based trans transportation demand management program, but I'm really appreciative that you all came. There are certainly lessons that I draw from this presentation on both infrastructure and incentives. So thank you both very much. I'm grateful for the invitation. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Yes, I know we have the full agenda, but I just did really want to express uh, how much we appreciate your leadership yeah, on this. I think sorry. this is crucial for Nashville yeah. um, and the data that you can provide. Um, I took a lot of heat on social media this week. <laughs> kind of stepping on into the, the, the TDM space right. and on TV. Um, I do want to uh, acknowledge Mr. Weaver, who called me on behalf of Bridgestone, Alliance Bernstein, his law firm, to see how they can engage in TDM. Um, so I think the successes that you all will have and your ability to communicate about it and show that will really be crucial for our city, and so we're grateful. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Also, for people viewing or for the benefit of anybody who sees this on the archives on Metro National Network, I have asked Ms. Hapkinshill to make sure that the presentation not visible on camera today will be available to the Metro National Network so we can hopefully tie it in uh, and, and possibly run that. All right, we will shift to business. Uh, Courtney, if, yes, uh, if it if it doesn't offend your sensibilities, I might skip the reports today. Okay. Um, I had some great things to I know. About. We'll, we'll save them for next meeting, uh, and we'll transition straight into business. Um, all right. We've, we've got, obviously, a package of resolutions and bills on second reading. We'll try to do this as we have by tradition with the consent agenda. Uh, please let me know if anything needs to be pulled. I know there are a couple things that probably by virtue of substitute or amendment or interest will be. Um, first up is RS-2019-1558 under resolutions, extends the license and franchise of Nashville Gas Company for an additional period. I know there was some discussion on budget and finance, but I'm not hearing any need to pull up today. Um, RS-2019-1559 uh, modifies the master list of architects and engineers originally approved by resolution RS-94-1050. Yes, ma'am. recused on that one. On that one. All right, then let's pull it off of consent. And you are going to be uh, marked abstaining. Is that correct, Councilman? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, RS-2019-1560 authorizes Rev LLC DBA the Nash Collection to construct and install area encroachments at 212 Broadway. RS-2019-1561 authorizes DBA PLLC DBA Stock and Barrel to construct and install an area encroachment at 901 Glebe Street. All right, and that takes us through resolutions. We will pull uh, RS-2019-1559 so that Councilmember Allen can be marked uh, abstaining. And otherwise, I would accept a motion to approve those on consent. Move. Move. Got a second. Motion and a second. All in favor, please. Actually, any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? New sentence. All right, perfect. So we've got those approved. Um, let's come back to RS 2019-1559. Um, I would accept a motion to approve. I have one quick question. Yes, ma'am. So it will be additional uh, farm is added to the list. Yes. Is there any uh, criteria to for selecting those engineering farm, and architectural farm, or are we uh, very conscientious about our new? Uh, ordinance about equal business opportunity. Uh, that's a great question. I would defer to Public Works. I saw Sharon or... Yes. 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 Do you Michelle Lane with Michelle, would you like Michelle to speak Hernandez to Lane, I'm Chief Procurement Officer. Thank you. So there is criteria for addition to the ANE master list. Um, we want to um, ascertain information from those firms related to um, the numbers of employees that they have, um, their location, um, the location of or where the business itself is domiciled, proof of licensure, as well as proof of insurance, and that is to be included on the list. Then there's a full selection process that is enumerated in the procurement code, uh, in the procurement regulations, pardon me, related to the selection, and the purpose there is to ensure that we have equitable distribution of work. As it relates to the EBO program, or as it relates specifically to the inclusion um, of minorities and women, we apply program to every one you know, of those projects as well. So in addition to the information that's laid out in the regulations, we want to ensure that disadvantaged business types have an opportunity to compete. And am I correct that as this resolution does, no, we could we pass a similar resolution reflecting any of those so, changges should you know, you need to modify it again in the future to be a court in accordance. I mean, with you could, process. but the way that the EBO is written, yeah. it would automatically, automatically include applies. these projects okay, because they come through the central procurement office. Thank you. Great question. Um, any other discussion? I would accept a motion to approve. 
So moved. Thank you. All right. We've got a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And Councilor Yale, I've got you as I'm standing. Um, and let's go to bills on second reading. Uh, we've got a couple that we can take on consent, I guess, uh, potentially. We'll start for you and see what we can do. Bill 2018-1388, abandons existing sanitary sewer main and easements and to accept new sanitary sewer main, sanitary sewer manholes and easements for property located at 3964 Woodlawn Drive. Chair, yes, uh, that was uh, deferred at the time of zoning, uh, deferred to the March. All right, let's pull it then and see if we need to do that here. Um, I am already confident uh, that uh, Councilman Roten is going to defeat. I'm correct that we'll pull this and defer it, right? All right, so we'll do that. Um, and we've got an amendment on uh, Councilman Syracuse's. All right, so let's let's see. I guess we'll have to pull that and do the amendment. And Elrod's is not on, so let's just take them all. Uh, no, we've got a few that we can do back here. Bill 2018-1442 approves the acquisition of interest in a parcel of real property from four parties and approving a participation agreement, a license agreement, and an easement agreement, all between the Metro government and Uptown Property Holdings in connection with the development of Nashville Yards. I'm assuming we'll want to pull that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Bill 2019-1458 authorizes Hickory Wood Senior Living LLC to install, construct, and maintain aerial and underground encroachments in the right-of-way located at 0 Murfreesboro Pike. Bill 2019-1459 authorizes SPLU Opus 29 LLC to install, construct, and maintain underground encroachments in the right-of-way located at 331st Avenue North. Bl 2019-1475 amends sections 1564-110 and 1564-140 of the Metro Code of Laws pertaining to the time period for which grading permits remain valid and review of grading permits and drainage plans. Anybody wish to pull that one? Your question on 75, please. Okay, let's pull that, and we have just got two. Uh, so I would accept a motion to approve bills 1458 and 1459. Second. Got a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, those are approved. Uh, and we will come back and take the others that need discussion. So, uh, uh, Councilor Johnson, you said BL 2018 and 1388 was deferred in planning? Deferred as planning. Okay. And, uh, first meeting in March. Do you want to By the sponsor. So I move to defer to the uh, first meeting, meeting in March. I okay, got a motion to defer to the first meeting in March. Second. Got a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Any abstentions? We've got that one. All right. Uh, Councilman Roten, we've got BL 2018-1404, amends section 68550 and section 1208-150 of the Metro Code of Laws to remove certain storage and impound fees for recovered stolen vehicles. I know you've got a substitute. Do you want to go ahead and do that or defer the whole thing? We're going to defer the whole thing. We're working on it and still working on the language of Mike Jamison, and I think it would be better if we just defer this to the first meeting in March. Okay. I've got um, and, uh, here I'm that as a motion. We've got a motion to defer until okay. the Okay. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. That is deferred. Uh, BL 2018-1407 amends section 1564-170B to clarify that all construction within the floodway must be consistent with requirements of the Stormwater, stormwater Management Manual. Uh, I know there is an amendment here. Um, Councilman Syracuse, did you have that amendment, or is that from public works? Okay. Is that a staff amendment, maybe? Yeah. Do you know what that is? Uh, oh yeah, right. It's a stormwater issue. <coughs> okay. Do you want? Do you know what that amendment is? <laughs> um, I I guess since there is an amendment proposed and it is not mine by my request, I guess we can. Um, I, I could go one of two ways here. We could take it, ask Mr. Jamison later on the floor, and see if there's a, an update there. He might have an update for us, and we could defer. Uh, I guess I would I would accept a motion either to defer one meeting or to move the amendment and see what happens on the floor. So there's no way for us to know what this amendment is? The amendment, Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. The amendment seems to be uh, housekeeping. Section 1 be amended by deleting it instead of saying the first paragraph. <laughs> move the amendment. I think wow. uh, I'm comfortable with that. I don't that know. Amendment. We might need to defer. <laughs> okay, yeah. Second. All right, all right, got a motion and a second on the amendment. 
Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, great. We got the am amendment carries, and I would accept a motion to move the bill as amended. So move. I have a question as uh, the bill as amended. I uh, thank you to the <laughs> Mr. Palco. So it says uh, the structure, certain structure, as long as it within uh, Metro Stormwater uh, Management Manual, it will be allowed. So what kind of a structure would be allowed in the floodway? Any design engineer or what? It could be a parking lot. It could be a parking lot. Parking lot. Parking lot. Whether we. When the Metro Council took up this issue after May 2010, mm -hmm. it was not clear in the stormwater regs that no new structures could be built right. in the floodway, so that's what we fixed then. But the term structure kind of left mm -hmm. available, so we had to come back and say, well, parking lots can with certain cases, this can with certain cases, so that's what this is. So, so a structure includes anything kind of built by, by man, but when we did that language, we left out the fact that there's other provisions of the stormwater rules that have to be followed. It made it sound like we said we're allowing parking lots, that the other provision of the stormwater regulations got kind of put aside, but they didn't. You still have to go through and do cut and fill and water quality, and you may have to go to the stormwater committee to get a variance. But, but those things that are, you know, when we say no, it doesn't mean no, that there could be some exceptions to those. Right. Like the, the, that the land is not entirely unbuildable, even if it might not be a freestanding structure. Correct. Councilor Johnson, is that satisfied? It's satisfied. Thank you. Mr. Falco, do you stipulate that if it isn't a floodway, it has to be uh, pervious, or does that get problematic because of the loose material, or what? I mean, is yes. it a case by case, or how? We would start at staff level by saying that that we would not be allowed. So you would have to go to the stormwater committee to get a variance for some of those things, okay. and and that's all brought up in those in those discussions. And you know, in our general code, do you still have to get a variance to build um, uh, pervious paving? Three or four years ago, that was kind of a quirk in the code, right? We wanted more people to do pervious parking lots, but they were having to get exceptions to do it. Have we normalized that? I think we've got that, that fixed. We, we've got a lot of that going on, and I don't believe all those cases go get very Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Councilmember Haywood, did you have something? No, I'm good. All right. Uh, any further discussion? All right. We've got a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Uh, that brings us to BL 2018-1441, amends chapters 1262 and 1284, Title 12 of the Metro Code laws regarding shared urban mobility devices. I know we've got, Councilman, am I correct that we have amendments and a substitute? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to move the second substitute and then uh, unless someone has an objection, I guess I'll take all the amendments together and I'll explain what it does. Right. You should have a summary. Um, the second substitute is very similar to um, the last substitutes. I won't necessarily go through that. Um, the let's, amendments. Let's get the motion on the second Sorry. substitute first. Yeah. All right, we've got a motion to move the substitute. <coughs> We've got a second, um, and now do you want to take this to explain the second substitute? Let's do that. Sure. Um, it just keeps in the soft cap of uh, four scooters uh, or four scooter companies, essentially, um, with an option to go to the TLC um, to uh, four, five, and up. Um, let, uh, one of the things it does, it lists the public safety reasons. Probably this is the biggest thing uh, for uh, limiting the number of companies, if you'll remember. I don't think he's in here. Mr. James' legal analysis, that was the one of the most problematic things. There was two things that were problematic. One of them was um, we potentially could be uh, creating monopolies, uh, but we, I believe we've put in uh, enough of the safety rationale of why we need to limit the number of companies. Um, the second is the due process regarding um, the number of companies. Right now there are five that have uh, permits to operate, and um, this would limit to four. And once we get done at the end of this, I want to address that. Um, and it, basically keeps everything else, creates a traffic offense um, if you're riding a, an SUMD if you're under 18, um, and makes clear some other things uh, in the uh, current ordinance, so I would uh, move approval. All right, we've got a motion on this and uh, a second on the second substitute. Any discussion on Councilman Elrod's discussion there? Just one question. <laughs> so do we give the TLC any guidance on what criteria they would use to consider when someone comes before them and asks to go beyond that, that soft cap? No, ma'am. I mean, I, I think the, I would no, and I've considered putting something in there for that, but I was afraid of, you know, 
being too broad, too narrow. Um, I don't know that there's, Mr. Fields can talk about it. They already do this with pedal taverns and taxi cabs and trekker, or wreckers um, and golf carts. I don't know if you have criteria for that, but uh, I would defer to him. There, what we don't have is specific ordinance requirements and uh, guidance from the council and through the ordinances. What we do, though, is take up, if a company's going to, tax cab is the most prominent one. If you're going to have a new tax cab company, you basically have to show that people aren't having rides and why they don't have rides and and why there is a great need today versus great need tomorrow. So it's actually a pretty intricate process and it's only we've only added companies during one period in the last 20 years. I'm not saying that means we're not going to add any scooters. It just means it's a challenging process when we put through public hearings in the commission. Uh, <coughs> did you have your hand up for discussion? Okay. Do you mind if I, else? yeah, I think Councilman yeah, Henderson. Uh, Councilman Henderson. Um, yes, I, I think my question was, um, I know several among us expressed concern last time about capping at four. When um, there are five approved. When there are five approved. Um, and, uh, you know, I appreciate the safety rationale, but I wonder if maybe you could ar articulate that some more. I have concerns about that. Um, additionally, um, I'm, I'm frankly concerned about, uh, you know, 16 years old versus 18 years old. I mean, we let 16 year olds drive two ton vehicles down the streets um, and out on the highway at 70 miles an hour, but we don't let 16 year olds take scooters. So um, to me, I, I appreciate safety, but I do think that is potentially an issue. Um, so those are my two primary areas of concern. So I don't know if you could speak Absolutely. to that. Okay. Are, you, are any of the amendments that you've got in the packet <coughs> four versus five no. issue? Okay. Uh, so I can address that now or, or wait? Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Let's, let, me, okay. let me just make sure we have all questions because maybe you can take them kind of all at once. Uh, Councilman Pridemore. Well, I want to uh, address the issue of four versus five, but now we're just now, this is just voting on to accept the amendment for discussion, right? This is the second substitute. Yes, I'll do. As, as originally filed and as substituted, it's four, correct? It, it still keeps it with yes, a softening of the cap to some extent. A little bit, a little perhaps. And I'm going to and I'll speak to the cap a little bit more. But, okay. Well, my 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 question is again then similar to uh, Councilor uh, Anderson. Is, you know, if they have we have five license and we have uh, we're going to cap it at four. You know, that doesn't sound like good business right. uh, as far as. Uh, legally, I mean, you know, we've, we've issued a, a, a permit, so to speak, and given the, uh, the we're knighting him to go ahead and start business, and then we said, whoa, stop, can't. Right. That's, so I think that's, that is problematic even in the second substitute, it sounds like, with the amendments. Other discussion from committee members? I know Council A. Wiener would, would like an ask. So my question is, is there anybody from Metro Legal in here? So, there you are, Terry. Um, sorry, I'll look straight past you. Um, has has Mike or anybody in Metro Legal evaluated the second substitute um, in terms of analysis since it was filed when Friday at noon? It sounds like I thought Mike had. I mean, he's had it since Friday at noon, but I have not talked to him about a legal analysis. I got it. Okay. Okay, so I'm not on the committee, but I think that it would behoove all of us to wait to address this until we have the opportunity to hear that analysis. I can't move to defer, but um, in, in regard to what in regard to what part? Um, the monopoly piece, um, the four versus five. Um, the other legal issues that are surrounding this, I think that we probably need to not rush to judgment on this, and we need to give us an opportunity to um, really do our due diligence on any changes that are coming before us, especially if we are looking at the potential for um, violating the spirit of any kind of existing laws. All right. Uh, let's see if we can get... Do you, what, yes, manager, you got you got some things. Yes, all right. Um, I'll I'll take the easier one first. Um, <laughs> as far as the 18 versus 16, it's already 18 currently in the ordinance. Um, the scooter companies, to my knowledge, all at least it used to be this way. None of them allow anyone that's under 18, um, and these are uh, adults renting a vehicle. Um, so but you can't rent a vehicle until you're 21 years old. 
So we're lowering it from the 25. So we're lowering it from 25 to 18. So I think it's a happy median. And again, it's a pilot project. And I even have an amendment later on that um, uh, ends the pilot project in a year. So for me, 18, I think, is, is uh, something good to have in there. Um, for the um, four versus five, um, I've been debating on that. Um, the part of me says that we've got a clause in the original ordinance that said, you know, you have to comply with anything the Metro Council passes. In theory, you know, we've talked about we can end this pilot project with an ordinance, you know, duly passed by the council, um, although I have an amendment that would, uh, would put in a sunset date. Um, but I want to put a floor amendment on to change it from four to five because of some of the legal concerns um, and talking with some of the companies. Um, I've been hesitant to do it um, for a variety of reasons, but I'll be offering that on the floor. But I'll need a suspension of the rules, so I wanted to put that out there. Um, as far as the monopolistic um, concerns in the um, legal analysis, um, if I remember the analysis correctly, um, Mr. Jameson went through um, a court case or some um, case law and attorney general's opinion with uh, concerns as far as um, limiting the number of companies, and I believe essentially towards the end of it, we needed to um, we need, had to have some public safety reasons um, to put in a you know capping the number of operators or um, limiting them. And um, in the ordinance, and I can go through them if you want. Um, let me see. Let's see one, two, three. Uh, I mean, it's uh, it's an extensive list that's in the ordinance, and I can go through the or in the substitute, excuse me, um, is for the rationale for limiting the number of companies. And additionally, it's also a soft cap to where the TLC can add them if they want. It is not saying we only want four, you know, we only want four or five, um, and. So I think we have enough reasons in the substitute ordinance to comply with the um, uh, for the soft cap. Um, although, if uh, I will absolutely ask Mr. Jamison to make a legal ask for his legal analysis um, by um, third reading, and if it's uh, by third reading, if it says it's absolutely doesn't matter, then I'll have to pull the ordinance. So I think that's kind of where we are on that. All right. Other discussion. Uh, one more question. Yes, Could we go ahead and hear from Terry so that she can give us an idea of their metro legal opinion on that? I, I'm not sure I have the official metro legal <laughs> opinion. I think I can speak only for myself. I did exchange an email with um, Mr. Cooper earlier today. And at that point, and I'm not 100% sure whether he was looking at the, um, the amendment or the second um, amendment, um, the concern was that the um, additional language was still not enough to get past the anti-monopoly issues um, uh, as articulated in the case law and, and authority cited in Mr. Jamison's analysis. So I tend to think that the council lady's suggestion would be prudent and that more time to review it would be a good idea. Well, I certainly would make the motion at the very least uh, to re-refer back to second reading either. I think any matter of economic regulation, which this fundamentally is, safety may be used as an excuse, but it is economic regulation. It's filled with unintended consequences, and I would welcome Mike Jamison, Metro Legal, and also members of the industry from their own separate vantage point to weigh in on their view as to the potential consequences of this before you get to that third reading you know, you have just hours to go before you have that. And I'll just confess, in school, um, which was a long time ago for me, um, regulation, I mean, it is a doctrine of political science. After the initial burst of reform, regulation is almost always used to promote oligopoly. And in this case, it may have only taken a few months to have that, you know, effect. And we can't be picking winners and losers in an industry that is evolving so quickly without mammoth input from the industry, all aspects of the industry itself. So, again, I would, at the very least, just move to re-refer back with all of this input being carefully collected. And I'm, again, grateful, as always, to Metro Legal to be nervous about this. So, um, um, Chair, what is the difference in regulating the number of SUMD companies versus taxi cabs or pedal taverns or uh, golf cart companies? So I think that the issue is um, that this regulates the certificates 
the number of companies, whereas in all those other situations that you just named, we, we regulate the number of vehicles. Um, all right, we've got a substitute that is moved and seconded. Um, you know, I guess, Councilman, I don't know if you would be willing to either amend your motion to re-refer to the committee. Okay. Absolutely. So I'm going to say at this point. So let's 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 get I guess a second on that. Um, what is the motion? It's on. The motion is to approve the second substitute and re-refer to this committee on third. On second. On second. On second. On second. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Are so you, you want to second. defer it for so a night? Defer, right. so defer, defer one meeting. Oh, yeah. Well, in effect, but to, to defer and re-refer. Re -refer. Okay. I mean, once all the analysis is in on I second see. with a I got it. robust uh, analysis of unintended consequences. I would ask, um, by way of hoping it's a friendly deferral, I do you think you could get done what we need to get done in one meeting, two meetings? Um, I think we can get the legal analysis in. One yeah. Are there other concerns? Um, I guess what I wanted to just express for for the community, um, I think you know we all get a fair amount of uh, email and consternation um, over uh, this issue, and I appreciate uh, uh, Councilman Elrod because it's it's a fraught kind of issue somewhat. Um, but I think uh, we as a committee need to think about, um, you know, working with uh, the companies, um, whether through just, you know, encouragement or something. I mean, in your district, uh, Councilman O'Connell, I would love to see um, the, I emails. Yeah, and <laughs> the, the scooter companies work with the downtown precinct um, in uh, an education effort of some sort. Fair warning to everybody, hey, we're out promoting awareness and what the rules are around the scooters on sidewalks issue. Because um, that's what people are burning us up about, and I think that is where the primary safety issue is. So I think just from a community understanding and education standpoint, not, I mean, I, I recognize you can't inextricably link that to this bill, but I'm just saying that I think we need to, as a, a public works committee, try to encourage law enforcement and the companies as we move forward on new this legislation. This will be the topic of a special meeting, so I yeah. think we'll get that opportunity. I, I just think we need to continue to discussion on this on bill? I we, do not. Okay. Yeah. Um, are you willing to defer one meeting? Well, I guess look, I'll go through my rationale um, <laughs> of why I picked limiting the number of companies instead of the number of scooters. Is that we've set up the ordinance to work with the providers, um, whether it's through data sharing, um, through partnering with Metro, and so I thought it was a good model and different than perhaps, you know, golf carts or pedal taverns because we're so dependent on them sharing data with us. Um, and if we change the model to limiting the, and it's a pilot project, and with an, uh, with an amendment that, that I filed, um, it would basically be a year pilot, or the, the pilot would end a year from whenever we pass this ordinance, which if it's, you know, third reading, you know, whenever it is next month, it'd be February of 2020. And so we would have a limited scope, and, um, you know, if you limit the number of companies, whether it's four or five, we get a one-year shot to figure out what it's like. And... Uh, I thought it was best to limit the number of companies because practically it, it would seem best to you know give whatever companies we have out there a shot at it instead of if you limit the number of uh, actual vehicles then you have um, you'll be comparing you won't be comparing apples to apples necessarily because you would have companies like Bird and Lime that have been on the streets longer uh, versus um, and um, and you could have companies that could come in after this, whether, you know, if we have a sixth or seventh, because I know there are at least two others that have contacted Mr. Fields, um, but, but have not applied yet, um, but have contacted him. Um, that if they come in, then if we limit the number of scooters, then we are saying, you know, you could have Bird or Lime or Lyft with a thousand on the street, or we could have, um, you know, if we cap the number, if it's a lower number, then the ones that come in later could have a, uh, a lower number of, uh, of scooters, and then we won't be able to, you know, compare different business models because they all do have different business models and the kinds of scooters that they have, uh, staffing, um, offering bicycles, and that kind of thing. Um, I think that there's enough here for um, the uh, for the public safety argument because I know for instance in one of the cases um, it uh, 
I think it was the Johnson City case, it required the um, the city went back to if you applied for taxi cab more taxi cab uh, companies, the 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 first three taxi cab companies actually got essentially the first right of refusal, and that's not something we're setting up here. We're we're letting the TLC set up the process, and we're not while the current companies are given notice under the ordinance, it does not say that they get the first right of refusal. Um, you know, it's not hey company number six comes in, are the five doing the good job? Well, they get if they want to increase their to 1,500 instead of allowing 500 more, um, you know, it's up that kind of model. So that's why I preferred something like this because, um, you know, if, if it doesn't satisfy enough with a second substitute, um, then, uh, you know, then we'll have to go to something like that or we just keep it as it is and have an unlimited number of scooters and un number an unlimited number of companies. Um, and I think that's, um, at least for me, I've been wanting to, to tap the brakes a little bit because I want this to work um, as well as possible um, if we are going to have it work. Councilman, you've got a motion for the substitute on the floor, and I, I misunderstood. Do you, are you comfortable with a one-meeting deferral and re-referral to this committee, or do you want to test your motion to approve the second substitute as is? Um, I guess I'll see what the will of the committee is. Have someone make a motion. So I'd like to. The reason I want to move it forward is because the longer it's, an, we've got three weeks before the next meeting, as we'll have um, you know, at least another month before we have some kind of limit in place. Um, and I'm worried. I'm <laughs> wanting to get something out there so there's some certainty um, in the public. All right. Um, at this time, we have a motion uh, that has been seconded, and you're comfortable with it re-referring to this Absolutely. on third Always. in your motion. All right. I'm well, sorry. Well, go, 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 I think I think a motion to defer. Oh, you you're good with that. Well, I think I motion and let's see where the committee is on it. I'd like to see where the committee. All right, so is. we've got a motion to defer one meeting and re-refer yes. on second in this committee. Yep. Okay. So we're not moving the substitute. Correct. Okay. Right. Well, that way I can you know change the second okay. substitute. Okay. okay. So we've got a motion to defer BL 2018-1441. Uh, one meeting and re-refer to Public Works. Second. Second. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any objections or any opposition? Any abstentions? Okay, so we are Fair. deferring one and uh, re referring. And thank you all for your time. Yeah, and, and with groups here, just to solicit their views on, on the substitute, from particularly from all the actors in the, in the industry, um, I think is an important contribution to that session. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, we will move on to BL 2018-1440. Wait, Councilman Johnson, real quickly. Hey, hey Lena. Lena. Did you have a question about 1475 that you wanted? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, let, me, let me record it for committee discussions since that's all. It's the grading one. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, yes. Uh, so just wanted to confirm uh, the difference is uh, the no permit will be issued during the, uh, what's the word, uh, pendency. Uh, the reviewing uh, during the reviewing process. Oh, okay. So just wanted to make you sure that's the intent. I will ask that question yeah. on your behalf if you don't mind. Thank you. I okay. appreciate it. All right, we will we will take a bill 2018-1442 approves the acquisition of interest in a parcel of real property from four parties and approving a participation agreement, a license agreement, and an easement agreement all between the Metro Government and Uptown Property Holdings LLC in a connection with the development of the Nashville Yards project in downtown Nashville as amended. Uh, <laughs> I would accept a motion. So move. And uh, we've got a motion to approve. And got a second uh, discussion. Well, I'm, I appreciate, I know people have a lot of questions. Um, Metro Legal, uh, last time we were here uh, on this, I believe we were told the 10th Avenue South, we, we don't really own it. Um, isn't that right, Tom? That, that we don't. Right? I couldn't the, hear a word you said. The last time that this was in Public Works, part of the narrative was that 10th Avenue South unclear title and we don't really own it. I don't think it's unclear. Um, the, the presumption is that municipal governments do not own the fee interest under their streets. The presumption can be overcome and there are a few places in downtown Nashville where we know that the opposite is true. If you're interested in the history, the, the part of the, the downtown streets that were platted uh, from the state of North Carolina, those we do own in fee. 
that plat does not go out as far as 10th Avenue, and there's no evidence that we could find that, that we own that street. So the adjacent property owners are presumed to own the center of the street. All right. So we own the street, and it's our street. It's our responsibility to spend money on it. Or we don't own the street. We, Which path are we on? We have an easement, typically, to for a public right-of-way, and we're responsible for maintaining what we have in the public right-of-way. It could be a street or it could be yeah. street plus other things. But, but we are, <clears throat> part of this transaction is selling that easement, right? Okay, I'm sorry, I misunderstood you. Yes. The, the, the transaction involves the four adjacent property owners who are presumed to own the fee transferring their fee to Metro so that we can give an easement to the developer. Which we are then passing on that easement. And then that easement is being used to construct an aerial bridge at, a on plaza. some part of a, a, a plaza. So you're actually using the space above, above the our easement for... Above our... What, what we will now own that street in fee. If the, if, the transact, if the whole transaction is approved, we will be obtaining the fee interest in that street. The problem that we're, the, the essential problem here is that we don't own that street and we can't give an easement if all we have is an easement. So in order to be able to give someone else an easement, we need to attain the, the fee interest in those streets. And so what this transaction would, part of what it would do is give Metro the fee interest in the, the relevant part of the street. Having obtained it, we can give an easement to the developer to construct the plaza. So, so we get it and, and move it on. And it is presumably quite valuable to the developer. Um, I will let the developer speak to that. I presume it is, but so is the fee, and, and it's, you would, you would think, I, we hadn't appraised it, but you would think that the value of the fee in the same property would probably exceed the value of the easement in that property. Well, all right, a fair question, right? What's our, what smart professional has assessed those values? I'm not sure that anyone has assessed those values. It isn't typical for us to charge for aerial encroachments, and this is a kind of aerial encroachment that is permanent rather than revocable. Well, but part of it is we're contributing a value with a hand here, actually with both hands, with both easement and participation. So it wouldn't be inappropriate to have some realistic view of that, of that trade. I'm not, I'm not going to dispute that. Okay. Okay. Um, is there any policy in Metro about what improvements are landlord responsibility um, that uh, on this site or multiple sites? I mean, it, I mean, it's at some point, <coughs> private development does improvements because they benefit from it. Okay. I, that's, I agree with that. I didn't. I, I lost you on the landlord. Well, is there? Is there, how? How does Metro determine what's our? What's the public responsibility on a private site? And by granting the easement, it is principally a private site at this point. We're still. We still have Tenth Avenue, and that'll be our responsibility well, to maintain. the bottom part of it. What, what currently is Tenth Avenue is going to stay Tenth Avenue. The difference, and again, I'll defer to the developer to describe it in more detail, but there, there will have some support structure that's in the right-of-way, and then they're going to build above that. But the, the public use of 10th Avenue is going to be largely unchanged and presumably improved, at least at the end. All right. Well, where did the 15 and a quarter million dollars come from? That foots back to what? I mean, I'm we're spending to to others on, on where that money came from, although it is tied to infrastructure improvements. Well, it is tied, but why is it it 100 percent of infrastructure improvements or 50 percent of infrastructure or 25 percent? Why 15 and a quarter million? I'm, I'm not sure how that particular number was arrived at. Those were things that I gather that uh, Public Works and Water Services saw as okay. most beneficial. But some of the 15 and a quarter million is going to sidewalks. I believe that is true. Okay. Don't we require every everybody else in the county to build their own sidewalks? Why are we paying for these sidewalks? That's part of the deal. Okay. How open are we, and I apologize, we got our sidewalk bill author here. How open are we to criticism from everybody in the county that they have to pay for their sidewalks and we're paying for these people's sidewalks? Well, we're getting a lot more than just sidewalks. Well, well we're paying for a lot more than just sidewalks, right? I mean, the sidewalks piece of this is relatively small. 
right? But everybody else is paying for sidewalks. Well, the way, the way we look at this, you and I talked about this earlier today, is that we're looking at everything in the right of way. And once you make the decision that you're going to replace the water infrastructure, which is substantial, it's sizable, you, you have basically have to tear up the whole street. Once you put in the new catch basins at the curb for the new storm drains, you have to rebuild the sidewalks. And so we just made that decision that it was one big project taking in you know, different components of metro water and public works. Right, but every, everybody else has to pay for the, side, their sidewalk, the sidewalks. I mean, yeah, we have to do the stuff under down, down here, but at the end of the day, when somebody's putting in a sidewalk everywhere else in the county. That, uh, we, we made collectively with, uh, with Matt and the mayor's office. Sorry, Councilor. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I recently had water projects done in my neighborhood, and as part of that, y'all came back in and did sidewalk work, which you paid for right. as part of that water project. Would that be similar to this? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I guess actually water paid for this. Metro, Metro paid for sidewalk work as part of the water works project, which, because was, you, you ripped everything up, and while you're yeah, at it, you fix it. That was one of our <coughs> Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Sturdman, Wallstrom, in budget and finance yesterday, um, and colleagues, I probably should have brought it into public works, but you all have on your desk in um, the uh, in the main council chamber um, a breakdown that uh, Public Works was kind to provide to me after I met with them uh, last Friday as we got into kind of asking questions at budget and finance. Um, uh, yesterday, I, I did become somewhat more um, concerned because I guess effectively, as, as I understand it, um, uh, Mr. Bone, uh, all the uh, sidewalk work that is being done will be done by the developer's contractor. It's been. Correct. It's correct. So... Metro, just to be clear, is not doing the sidewalk work. We are, through this participation agreement, cutting you a check to pay for a certain percentage of the sidewalk work that is being done, potentially related to water, et cetera. Um, is that correct? So, the, it's, oh, sorry, yeah. But that sidewalk work is done pursuant to plans that Public Works approves, and then they have to accept the work that is done before payments are made for that, if that helps with that. Understood, because that kind of sets up a structure through which we have also costs that Metro would incur related to inspection, project management, uh, yeah, inspecting it and accepting it, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, you know, to the point that um, Councilman uh, Cooper made, you know, this council, um, <coughs> myself with 37 co-sponsors, passed unanimously a strategic framework for sidewalks, right? And it's not sidewalks everywhere. I mean, we looked at, um, you know, uh, centers, whether suburban, downtown, otherwise, UCO, et cetera. But we do now have, we have elevated our sidewalk requirements. So, you know, commercial developers, multifamily, commercial, home builders, we are requiring them to build sidewalks and, um, and, and contribute right away. Um, and we're not paying a percentage to them, right? And so um, I think, you know, this is something this committee was talking about last time. You know, when we as district council members have countywide conversations about, you know, why we can't deliver on sidewalks out of that $30 million bucket. Um, but, uh, you know, if uh, there's a big project, which is a great project, truly. I mean, I, I think we're all excited about what's going to be downtown, that, um, you know, you can go to the administration, and rightly so, it's complicated. Um, there's uh, economic incentives involved. But especially in that sort of, you know, public work space that, um, you know, 
you are afforded the opportunity to negotiate. Um, it's not that we're not otherwise getting other benefits, but in that particular space where you know Metro is paying back to you. Um, to my client. To your client, rather. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Mr. Patton. <laughs> Metro is this not is writing reported. a check <laughs> to, uh, to Mr. Thomas <laughs> Metro is not writing a check to Mr. Bowen, saying that on the record. Um, but I guess, you know, I am, I just, I, I struggle with this because I understand that um, uh, in, in the water space that we're getting into really old infrastructure and old pipes and in time, uh, the stormwater impacts. And so I acknowledge that there is a benefit to Metro of having this work happen at the same time. But what's happening is the developer is doing the work and Metro's paying them for a part of that. Um, in the water space, I'm a little more comfortable, but in the sidewalk space, nowhere else in this county do we do that or afford that courtesy to any other developer or that opportunity. Um, and so I guess I just want to understand, um, you know, we'll be paying to the developer these certain um, amounts, you know, 1,000 or what, rather 1,200,000 for 10th Avenue, 245,000 for 9th Avenue. So we've parsed it all out. But what are we paying? Who's going to inspect them? Who's going to accept them? Who's managing it? Who, who <coughs> else are we paying? Let, let me add a couple of things. So and I, I think we might have misconnected on this last night, but um, what this is are, are costs that were defined by the development team that could be eligible as part of that 15.2. Okay, but we're not going to reimburse for 16. Okay, so the way this project works is, is if we approve this, then we they do the work and submit uh, application for reimbursement invoice. An invoice, if you will, and then we would inspect it. Now, let me say also that we're going to inspect it anyway. Hey, we're going to inspect the sidewalks at Fifth and Broad. We're going to inspect the sidewalks at everything that's being built downtown. So we would inspect it. This one is huge. We have five people at Public Works that do this for the whole county. Mm -hmm. That includes Century Farms, River North, Fifth and Broad, the yards, and everything else in Davidson County. So, and we'll try to do it. We'll try to do the work ourselves. To the extent that we need help, we'll call on one of our contractors. Yes. In this case, it would be Collier's Engineering. So far, they've helped us verify those costs, and we've paid them an amount of, of approximately less than $2,000 in the last year. We uh, worked on this today, and we mm -hmm. think that the... If, if we were to give you an estimate of what we would spend with them over the life of this project, it's less than $100,000. And so I, I guess what I would ask is then, you know, what if we were instead to pay ourselves that $100,000, right? So that we had more staff in Metro Public Works to inspect and accept <laughs> sidewalks. And, you know, that's something that we as a committee have, have talked about. I mean, basically, Public Works has over time been gutted. So now, so. Councilman Henderson and I are getting on the same page. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, I want everyone to know. Well, right, but I mean, if we look at, you know, sidewalk delivery, all these things, you know, the challenge to Metro on a time of delivery and a cost of delivery is because we do not have enough staff internal to public works to execute this sort of thing. So in my view, we kind of bend ourselves into a pretzel um, to participate in this and then our subcontractors get a piece of it and you know it's just overly complicated in my view and so um, I again understand why there is the engagement in the water space but um, I, well, I, I just if I could yeah. also if you don't mind um, a lot of the projects downtown particularly in the sober area are single buildings 
And so the development isn't big enough for us really to improve the infrastructure in a, in a, in a more meaningful. Uh, meaningful way. So what we end up with is kind of a patched together infrastructure that we'll be working on for, for years to come. All those projects are good in and of themselves, but rarely do we get the chance to have something so large that covers blocks of property where particularly the water department can go in and make you know significant changes. And again, once you've made that decision, then there's a whole bunch of things that have to follow on that. We could have made this a 100% water project for 15 million, and they could have done the that they could have supervised the, the whole thing. It's just the way that we... But why didn't, why did we not do that? It's, it's just a, a decision we made. Uh, we who? Uh, working with Matt and the yeah. mayor's And office. why did you make that decision, Mr. So, I, I think this was the right way to do it. Okay, I'm, I, so, I appreciate your opinion. just as easily have done it. But it just, you know, again, we're always kind of here, and it's, uh, you know, there's like the, the Mr. Cross's piece and, uh, you know, the easements and all this, and then there's the water piece. And the and so what has happened historically is, frankly, we don't drill in on the level of detail. Yeah. And, you know, we're just like, ooh, this is complicated. We all know it's, you know, on the whole good. Stamp it, send it on. Yeah. So, I mean, I just want to understand from your perspective why you think Metro, um, needs to offer up this extra uh, 15 million. Sure. Yeah. And I, so, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Matt Wilshire from the mayor's office, I oh, agree. Mm -hmm. yeah. For the public. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that's how I'm supposed to do it. Um, I really appreciate all of the questions, and these are great questions, and actually I appreciate them because I think that these questions are questions I think lots of people across the county probably have, and so it's great to have an opportunity to get to talk about this. This is an amazing project from the private development side in terms of what it will create in terms of opportunities for Nashvilleians, in terms of the construction activity that's being created, creating jobs immediately for Nashvilleians, and as Director Sturdivant was talking about, incredible opportunity to fix some infrastructure, both on the water side and on the public work side, to make sure that we have a coherent, well-operating infrastructure. And this body has charged the administration, charged metro government, has directed and has instructed to get infrastructure right. And here is an opportunity to get a lot of infrastructure right over 14 and a quarter acres. I can give that an amen. And, and, and so, to your question, there are a variety of things. This, you're right that there is work being done here that is not typical for a single-family home in, in in a particular district. The scope and scale of this development is estimated to create f over four hundred million dollars of property taxes going forward, and that happens in part if the property is valuable because it's built upon well-structured infrastructure. And so we together with uh, Public Works and the Water Department took a look at what the opportunity was to create that well-functioning infrastructure and the other benefits that the city would get. And a couple of those have been mentioned already. Um, in most developments that home, where homes are built or even buildings are built, people don't create public parks uh, at, at their own uh, cost. Uh, construct those parks and have public parks open uh, with connectivity to greenways. Well, that's not an expectation that the city has. That's what the city is getting in this instance. And so they are complicated, and, and I'm happy to talk. There was a calculation made about the incremental benefit that we could have from a well-functioning public works infrastructure and water infrastructure and an allocation made based in part upon available resources from the water department, <laughs> what they had available today to do that, what public works has available, and then a creation of the capital spending plan that was uh, voted on and discussed in October. So Did that answer I, your question, sort of? A little bit. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, I appreciate what you shared, but um, I guess, you know, it's all kind of relative depending on the context. So, you know, there are, um, uh, you know, multifamily and commercial builders on particular corridors, um, you know, that are making fairly significant um, investments running a long stretch of a street that, you know, we in time hope to be a, a transit corridor. So I get it. Downtown Nashville Yards, again, yay, great project, big, really big. Um, but, you know, 
we don't out in that suburban context or otherwise or on our major arterials. And so, you know, I, I guess I would just say that we should be mindful of the position that we put ourselves in when there is the assumption that, well, if it's a project of a certain size or if it's, you know, it, that, um, you know, again, you know, we'll, we'll move heaven and earth and figure out something to get you the best deal that you can, but, you know, step that down a little bit. And I'm not saying all the way to the single family home builder, but respectfully, their margin's a lot tighter yeah. than the margin is here. Um, and so, you know, in the middle are, you know, commercial and multifamily builders doing significant projects with housing and retail and taking up big whole city blocks. Um, and we expect and require them to do all that infrastructure themselves. And, we, and we, don't, we don't participate in, in that. We and, actually do and have over 200 times over the last decade where we've created, uh, we've well, made... Well, your office sent me something that said you've only done three of yeah, these participation so, agreements. So, so that are specifically related to economic development, but all the time the water department, and, and this was something I believe that the council office pulled, and uh, Councilman Cooper, you may recall exactly what the number was that... Uh, Councilor Jameson poll, but 200. Water department specifically? For public works and water across all of Metro government, I think there were like a couple hundred of them that were done where. Uh, a, a, I've got a list with 13 participation uh, agreements for uh, water. 13. Uh, sure. So the, including the ones from. Right. So oh, within the last five years. Okay. So all the time when people are building new developments, Metro asks for additional infrastructure to be put in place. And so we do participate in those instances and have in a number of instances to get additional infrastructure constructed at the same time. Okay. Um, so in this particular uh, case, I guess, um, can you speak then, Mr. Sturdivant, to traffic uh, signalization at 1.8 million at the top of this list? Is that at 10th and Broadway? Okay, so that's at 10th and Broadway. So, um, Mr. Wilshire, in the CSP, we had $10 million for 10th and Broadway, correct? I think that's in the CIB or CSP? The CSP. Yes. Specifically, okay. Um, and so I guess what I'm struggling with is the numbers I've been given by water, the numbers that you have provided here, if we look what is in the CSP and we try to add it all up, I don't find it all adding up. It's not. I mean, we, right. uh, what we have in the capital budget, I believe, is 15. In the CSP, we, Public Works has three. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the thought was is that this would take place over four years. So, so we have to go, we have to have some of this in future spending plans. <laughs> so, um, we have three. Water has 3.25, I believe, for this year. The, the document says they can't, in one year, they can't request more than six. So some of the boundaries of what we're working with. Okay. Um, so, uh, project management. Um, you have in here is $945,000, but you have re-estimated that with the thought that that will now only be 10000 or is that inspection, or how is that? Can you speak to the Collier piece specifically? That's their project management. That's not ours. So, okay, so we're two, paying the developer for project management. There, there are two things in here that I think are kind of unusual. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one. And it's always in there. It's usually just rolled up into other things. I mean, you have to have it if you're a developer. The other one that's on here is temporary power, which you also have to have for a project. But I've rarely seen it broken out, but it was in this case. Uh, those are things that could be re reimbursed for. So the traffic control and utility demo, how is that different from... Um, the, the traffic signalization. That's, of, uh, that's, that's just that's associated with construction. Okay. So that so what is the utility demo? That's the, the demolition of the old. Okay. 
right? And so why do these utility and water numbers not add up to the numbers provided by water? Well, I don't know what you're... Okay. Well, I'm looking at water saying that they are going to spend $2.35 million uh, and stormwater is going to spend 900k. That is not to exceed 3.25 million, as far as the water department's investment, 3.25 million. But as added up here on this sheet, there's this part here with sidewalks, and that's fairly small relative to the overall total. And then there's a lot more water stuff in here that exceeds. So, are you, as Public Works? in our capital spending, <coughs> taking on water? Like, do you, do you see what I'm getting at? Mm -hmm. Okay. So there are specific line items so that, and, and I hope the folks from water will clarify if I mess this up, but the revenues from the water department are specifically bond proceed water, bond proceeds for water bonds that are issued that are repaid by rate payers. And so the source of funds for this project, for that collection of things that will be funded overall, that amount we are limiting in order to essentially cap the exposure of the water bonds at 3.25 million, 900,000 from stormwater and 2.35 from water. And so we've discussed this sometimes before, like as far as water, how y'all write your bonds, right? So whenever you get into doing what you're doing, you're often getting into the sidewalk space, right? But then public works, has to like eat that because your bonds don't speak to the ability to bond out to do that repair work, Correct. right? So there's some of that factoring in, right? Correct. But I don't think that necessarily speaks to the very sizable discrepancy here between 3.25 million and the utility total here of 11.48 million. That's, that's seven to eight million dollars in difference. Correct. I, I don't know. Can, there's a lot more infrastructure that's going to be built yeah. than is in this agreement right. that we're going to reimburse for. I mean, it goes to the 80, 80 million. Is that, is that so I, I guess, Mr. Ben, just so I can understand. Um, I appreciate the $80 million uh, in investment, which frankly is just commensurate with the size of your project. Like this is a huge project and you all are, you know, interestingly going kind of above and beyond elevated park space and, 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 and so on. So, um, you know, it's, it's both a, uh, a factor of it being kind of a visionary interesting project and just sizably, frankly, huge, right? So, you know, from a point of negotiation, respectfully, I just, um, you know, if you're already in for that amount, I mean, to me, to negotiate and kind of come back and just sort of parse out this percentage that, you know, taxpayers have to fund back on particular sidewalks that anywhere else in the county, y'all would just be required to do. Um, you know, how do you how do you speak to that? I mean, what, what is the need other than, um, yes, the massive community benefit, I'm not disputing any of that, but it just seems that, frankly, you know, it's what we're struggling with in Metro is the perception of access, sure. our access, right, right? Like, you can go to the mayor's office and get this deal worked out. Sure. Um, well, I, I'm disappointed that the, the inference about access and transparency mm -hmm. and accountability Having said that, where I think this differs from any other project in the county, this is a partnership with Metro. We started with Gresham Smith here, Reagan Smith. I mean, Reagan Smith is here. We've got. We started with Metro and kind of laid this out and said, "Look, here's what we're thinking from an infrastructure standpoint. As a part of that, what else would you all like to see? What makes sense from Nashville Next? What makes sense from the community?" And they spent a long time. We spent about two years planning deeply with that infrastructure. And then the second piece of that conversation was, okay, having said that, what parts of this would Metro have to do anyway? What parts are we either being asked to do or the result of this creating infrastructure that will support 
other pieces of downtown outside of our boundaries. And what you ultimately get out of that is the city gets the, the park amenity, you get the realignment of 10th and Broad, you get a lot of the, you get a lot of beautification, you get broader sidewalks, you get a lot of different stuff that but for this opportunity and but for this partnership would certainly have to change. And so we, we it was looked at as a partnership, and I know the question's been asked a couple of different times away, and frankly, that was that's a place we never hoped to get to. But certainly, the developer would work to make that up in other parts of the project from pieces that I think Metro has said or the community has said, this is really important to us. And I'm, I'm going to yeah. let me just jump in here as, yeah. as representative of the district where this project is taking place. We moved an extraordinary acreage that had been parked off of the tax rolls onto the tax rolls in a way that almost no other district can at this scale with a return that is going to be Again, at a magnitude level, you've already identified unprecedented. Could I add one other thing just yeah, as sure. an example? Um, so I think this was six weeks ago as they're doing some of that water work, they had a clay pipe. Nobody knew that clay pipe was there. Metro Water came to us and said, hey, we think it's in your best interest and our best interest to change that and to go ahead and replace that. If we didn't think that this was a reasonable likelihood, that probably would have been a different decision. That didn't change Metro's piece of this. The developer did that in part because they viewed this as a partnership. And when you ask about the project line item, right, that's not just project management. That includes contingency for things like that. It includes a lot of engineering, a lot of design, all, all your different various consultants that make all those other pieces go. And to Mark's response, we were trying to be as transparent as we could, breaking it out line item by line Appreciate item, that. instead of yeah. just a couple, and you, it even goes to the dollar in many places, as opposed to just making it broader. So. But I think in a complexity of deals, like this is what we, I think, and you, I hear from the community, I hear from my colleagues, right, there's so many different parts, and you know, water's over here, and this is over here, and then we've got the land sale, and we've got the thing, and the, you know, and so on the whole, yay, is it a collective good, awesome you know, approve it, send it on. But I think, um, you know, Mr. Bone, you spoke in kind of our first uh, committee meeting when we first kind of engaged on this. You know, if you did not receive this, uh, you know, $16 million, $15 million, you know, uh, from Metro, what would that mean for your project? Sure. Um, and, uh, you know, so I guess, you know, the question comes again. I would just say to Mr. Wilshire, it's a lot simpler for the community to understand downtown, old clay pipes, water work that needs to be done, marry those projects, and let's just pay for the park, right? So instead of parsing out all this different stuff because it's related to water and this is here and that's there and Collier gets paid this, you know, why don't we just contribute the, you know, amount for water and the amount to pay for the park? Right? Isn't that easier? So, so you know? I, yeah. I mean, look, I I appreciate the question. Yeah. I may be doing a terrible job for the city, and I I like I'm not I, I, no, that no, 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 no. But but you said that Metro is not getting a return on its investment, and that, I that's didn't okay. Say that. Okay. No. I did but, not but say it, that. But if we're okay, I'm, I, I did not. Metro say that. is. I, I believe maybe you're inferring that Metro is not getting an ad adequate. Uh, uh, for its investment. I am just saying that these deals are overly complicated. Okay. They lack transparency. There is a <clears throat> perception that, um, you know, that, you know, we'll move heaven and earth for um, uh, yeah, certain developers and certain projects downtown. I'm talking uh, to perception, okay? Um, and, you know, back out in our districts when we can't deliver on, you know, the sidewalks that are supposed to be in an objectively scored bucket. I'm, I'm just asking you all, I think, to think about process, okay, and how we go about doing these things. Um, I respect that these are complicated, <laughs> big projects. I'm not trying to nitpick and micromanage. I'm just asking you to understand from the perspective of our constituents and this council that um, let's keep this more simple. 
let's keep it more clear. I appreciate the level of detail that was provided. Anytime we go through one of these, it is a learning experience. But, um, you know, I would just go back to what I said previously as to the capability of Metro Public Works to inspect and receive and do all these things. Like, we've, we've got to, we're just, we're out of whack, in my view, in, okay. in the way we, we do this. Yes, yeah, respectfully, yep. we are into announcements. We've been so, at it for more than 90 minutes. Yep. Did you? Okay. Um, that's, that's just, it. if it's helpful at all, I, I was actually going to make a motion to approve, but to re-refer, given the discussion here, to re-refer back on third. It is amendable on third. And I do think this committee, which has done so much, really, for our sidewalk policy, does need to be comfortable about the policy of reimbursing anybody for sidewalks that we're making other people. And that and that, that alone is worthy of a third reading discussion, given, given that it's amendable on third, if, if everyone approves. Appreciate that. Okay, we've got a motion to second. approve and re-refer. And a second. Second. Discussion. I, I, the re-refer, I mean, Naturally, I, I, I want to approve it um, because I, I'm looking at maybe more of a little simplistic way. We have auditors, we have project engineer, we have project overhead. I mean, Mr. I mean, you, what we're saying is here that that our the, the director of well, I don't want to say we're saying that, but maybe in, in some implications that that there should, could be better ways of doing this than what is being done. Now. Um, I, I, and I appreciate Councilor Henderson's uh, uh, time that she has put into this in order to uh, have these very uh, articulate questions. However, not all of us have that opportunity to do that, and so we, we have to rely upon the, our experts and directors of, of uh, each uh, department. So, therefore, I think we have the, we have the safety, uh, uh, safety valves in projects like this. And if we don't, then we can implement them. I suggest we implement them. But if we do, I think those questions also need to be directed toward those safety valves, those the the, the auditors or the people that's responsible for all that. But uh, I, I think to and uh, uh, to Councilman Cooper's uh, credit, I, I appreciate wanting to re-refer it. But I just think, with that in mind, I think it should just be approved and um, move forward. All right, thank you. Any other discussion? Yeah, I just, this is the Public Works Committee, right? Correct. So, I mean, we just spent like half an hour talking about money, which is really not exactly a Public Works purview. I mean, I agree that we need to look at the systems that we are using and, and the, the policies that we are engaging with other people, give them a framework. But that's why we divide the council work into committees so we can look at this cap from the top, from the side, from the bottom. In this case, I, I think we should, if we ask them to come back, we should give them very precise instructions of what power rewards questions do we have for them that we need clarification. I, I guess I'm, as chair, I'm in a similar position. I, I Procedurally, I think deferral to just buy time with no work uh, don't do much. And Councilman, I don't know if, if your intent is on discovery of something else. Right, and so he's not requesting a deferral, though, right? It's, it's approval on second it's approval. 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 Uh, that's okay. And re referral. referral back right. to answer any of the questions. And, and ideally, <clears throat> we write any of them out. I, I thought I was specific on that it gives me a little bit of anguish that we're reimbursing on a sidewalk policy that can seem to a lot of people unfair and that we just need to be clear about how we're handling stuff like right. that Fair and enough. that we're all a little vulnerable to the developer in our district going, hey, you made me do it. And so we, it needs to be um, an act of commission rather than omission. All right, for us to do that. And I We've think got to, okay. Respectfully to Councilman Bednay, I mean, we are charged with oversight of the Public Works Department mm -hmm. and the process that they engage, which is inextricably linked to money. I mean, that, that's that's what we do here. So, I mean, we ask the questions of budget and finance. So, it is, it is both to process, it is to, you know, with whom uh, Public Works is contracting to do this work. With whom they are contracting has been under an immense amount of public scrutiny. Um, and so uh, I just think, um, you know, I, I feel comfortable with this going forward now, um, but I do still have a few more questions in the sidewalk space and related to contractually what we're going to do with the inspection piece. We're so. an inch full. We work hopefully pretty well together. I love the fact that 
Mr. Bones here, and hopefully he can go to his client and say, do we really need to be reimbursed for the sidewalks or not? He may say yes or no, but let's ask that question. Chair, if I may <coughs> say, I mean, I don't mind us talking about the money and, and this citywide policy issues. I'm just saying that if we're going to repeat the same argument in each committee, we'll never get to the end of it. I think we should really, with all due respect, uh, just try to use our committee work to discuss committee-related issues. I, I sound like an old fart, and I apologize if I, if I do that. <laughs> just, just out of efficiency, that, that's what I'm, I'm saying. So right. I apologize. I, I don't mean to. I mean, you guys have some excellent questions that need to be answered, uh, but I, I was just uh, making that point. All right, we're about to lose our quorum. Uh, I've got a motion to yeah. approve and re refer to Public Works on third. <coughs> All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. And any abstentions? Okay. Uh, we've got one more item, just very quickly. Uh, I've heard from the sponsor. We've got a request for a one meeting deferral on BL 2019-1475. We've been able to get in the room. Uh, I would accept the motion to so move. one meeting. Second. Got a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. I haven't heard that one before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take me with you. <laughs>